So yeah, so today we're going to be looking at lake house versus warehouse. This is obviously within Microsoft Fabric. Um, so just before we get going, my name is Michael Johnson. I am a uh, data platform MVP based in Johannesburg, South Africa. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to start off with this slide, which I think everybody who has been to a Fabric talk this week and probably for the last year is somewhat familiar with. And what this looks at is the seven workloads that Fabric has, right? So uh, each one of these workloads does something different. Some of them do kind of something similar, right? So there is some that uh, uh, deal with ingesting data, some that deal with sort of transforming it, and others that deal with presentation. The ones we're going to be looking at is the data engineering one and the data warehousing one. Okay, so if we think about these two kind of experiences, these translate loosely to the data lake house and the data warehouse. Okay, so uh, if we think about these two uh, uh, sort of environments, they're actually, we, we tend to think about the engine that's built on top of them. So each one has a slightly different engine. The data engineering engine is actually built on top of Spark. So Spark is an open source uh, analytics engine, or, uh, uh, and uh, it's sort of, uh, it is, again, it's, it, it's open source. Microsoft have taken it. They've sort of added their own sort of secret source that makes it work nicely with a, a fabric, and they have sort of released this as an engine. The second one is the data warehouse. Now, uh, the other name you, you'll see in that chart we saw earlier, it's often called the Synapse Data Warehouse, which is very confusing given that there is a product called Synapse Data Warehouse and it is not that thing. Okay, it works a little bit similar, but it is not the same thing. Um, it is a SQL engine though, but it's not the SQL Server engine that you probably use today in your on-prem environments. So it has been fully rewritten to work with a different underlying sort of storage architecture. So we no longer have uh, MDFs and NDFs and behind the scene. We don't have, uh, uh, you know, sort of, um, uh, sort of non-clustered indexes. We don't have any of those things. Instead, we have this common format. And that really comes out to the, the thing that binds Fabric together, okay? And that is this idea of one lake. So one lake is that unified storage layer across uh, across all the services um, that allows everything to communicate. And Microsoft sort of, when they came up with One Lake, sort of had three of these promises they gave us. The first is security. I'm not going to speak about security today. Casper uh, had a talk a little bit earlier. Uh, but, but the other two promises they spoke about is this idea of one format, okay? And one format's made available in something called Delta Lake. You will have heard it called Delta Lake, Parquet Delta, sometimes just Delta. It's all the same set of technologies. This is a, uh, a storage format that was developed by uh, Databricks, okay, uh, to support their implementation of Spark. They have since open sourced it, and Microsoft used that as an industry standard. Okay, so both of these engines, or all the engines within Fabric, have to be able to talk to this layer. So not only would data engineering be writing Parquet files, but so would the data warehouse. And we wouldn't just write a single Parquet file. Obviously, that's not a very exciting database. We'd, ha we'd have multiple tables within a single entity. Now, when we create each one of these sort of artifacts, whether that be the, a data engineering sort of artifact, or, or maybe a data lake, or a data warehouse, essentially a new storage account gets provisioned for you. It's something, as a SaaS service, you don't see the bits underneath it. So you're not going to go and provision something within the Azure portal and you're not going to secure it. Microsoft's taking care of all of that for you. So you just click, you know, click, click and create and then it, it provisions these things for you. And we can then sort of, uh, 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 sort of access data. So the second uh, or, the, or, or the third promise that uh, Microsoft gave us with OneLake was this idea of one copy. Because we're all speaking the same data format, it becomes possible for different workloads to read and write from, from the same sets of files, right? And there's a little bit of caveat around that. So if we think about data reads, each of these workloads is capable of reading from its own sort of internal store, okay? But it's also capable of reading from other stores. Okay, now this is often done in the short in the terms of shortcuts. So shortcuts allow us to create these sort of mount points, if you will, to something else. And that can be within your lake uh, or your one lake, or it could be external. Okay, so we're not talking about external shortcuts right now, but we have the ability to, to actually read data from different uh, uh, systems. Okay, and then same, same, same sort of thing happens on the right side. So we have this ability to, to write down from these workloads into their own uh, Delta Lakes. But what we can't do is we can't write from one 
object type to the other. And there's a reason for this, because each, each of these engines uh, sort of has abilities that the other one doesn't, okay? So while Delta Lake, the format supports all of the features that we need, Okay, each engine supports different things. So simple examples, if we think about something like SQL Server, SQL Server supports this notion of multi-table transactions. So this is how I can do uh, financial systems. I need to make sure an invoice header, uh, invoice row items are all inserted in a tr transactionally safe way, right? We can call those asset properties. You know, that's something that the warehouse can give us, but the lake can't. Uh, so there are uh, reasons why uh, we can't write from one engine to the other. But we can always read from any, any platform, right? Okay, so that is the, the writes. The next thing uh, uh, sort of Fabric gives us is when we go and create these uh, uh, sort of objects, it creates these two uh, stealth objects, if you will. You might, you might want them, you might not, okay? Uh, but the first thing is this SQL endpoint. Okay, so a SQL endpoint is this T-SQL uh, 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 sort of uh, access point where I can go and issue queries. Now this is a read-only, Endpoint. So this is not a full version of something like the data warehouse. It's also not exactly the same thing as Synapse Serverless. Okay? It, it serves a similar purpose, but it doesn't support the same notions, especially things like external tables. Okay? That notion doesn't exist. The other thing that gets automatically created when we uh, create either of these artifacts is a semantic model. So that semantic model is essentially, it's like a Power BI data set that has all of the tables within our, within our structure automatically surface as if it were a Power BI model, and we can go and string some basic relationships, and then we can use that for querying our objects. I wouldn't recommend using the default semantic model for anything more than exploratory analytics, because there's a whole bunch of stuff we can't do to it, uh, you know, around source control and changes and all that kind of thing, right? Okay, so, so, so we have these two objects. Now, the data engineering workspace gets one of each. So we get the semantic uh, 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 sort of model, but we also get the SQL analytics endpoint, which means that we can actually start issuing T-SQL-like commands, so exactly like we know how to do in something like a tool management studio, we can do those kind of commands uh, against, the, uh, against the lake. And then the data warehousing side, we can, uh, we've got this model, but it wouldn't make sense to create a SQL analytics endpoint because it is itself a TC, you know, it's, it's a SQL engine. So we don't need another sort of layer of abstraction. Okay, so you'll only get a semantic model with the lake house, but both of them support this idea of being able to query with T-SQL. Obviously only one can modify with T-SQL. Okay, so that's kind of what the two have in common, but let's probably look at what sets them apart because that's really how we're gonna go around determining whether we want to do, uh, you know, which one we're gonna choose or if we're gonna actually go with both of them because we saw that's possible, right? Okay, so the first thing we might consider is what types of data are we working with? Now, it, when we work in a relational, uh, uh, you know, most of us come from a relational world, this, this conference is called SQL Bits, right? It, it is a relational engine and there we have tables. So tables are simple structures of rows and columns where all of the columns have a single data type, right? So we don't have some sort of uh, uh, sort of some sort of complex type. All of these things are uh, scalar values. So whether they be integers, strings, dates, uh, Boolean values, right? So so these are the types that make it up there. But again, it's not a single table. Okay, a single table wouldn't be particularly useful. So we have multiple tables that get supported in the data warehouse. What we don't have from the relational world is this idea of relationships between tables. So there are no foreign keys, which might be a little bit scary for people coming from uh, OLT, like an OLTP world where we use foreign keys to protect us from ourselves. Okay, this is obviously for data warehousing. We should be managing quality somewhere else. Okay, so you're not gonna find those kind of artifacts working here. Data lakes, a little bit different. They also have this, the notion of tables, but the tables are a little bit richer. Okay, so we can actually have complex types within our tables. So if I have a, an array of values, instead of having to normalize that like, like we would in SQL, we'd probably create a, a mapping table and some sort of uh, bridging tables. Um, we don't need to do that here. Yeah? Data types can actually support these sort of complex complex types. Challenge with creating those complex types is if I use something like T-SQL to query it, T-SQL doesn't understand what that is, right? So, so we need to think about how we are uh, bringing data in. Uh, if we think about the medallion architecture that we hear about, 
we'll probably have those nested types in something like bronze, and we'll clean them out in our subsequent layers. All right, uh, the next thing we get is a folder. Now, a folder isn't technically data in itself, uh, but we often use it for metadata. Uh, we often use something like Hive partitioning, where we'll create a, a sort of folder for each uh, object, and then we'll break that down maybe per day, you know, year, month, day. Uh, so those, that folder structure can provide important metadata, even though it isn't data itself. But the big thing is we've got this idea of files. And this is where the semi-structured, no, uh, non-unstructured uh, sort of uh, uh, debate comes in with uh, uh, sort of that NoSQL movement. So we can bring in relatively uh, tabular objects, CSV files, for example. We can bring in something slightly more uh, complex, something like a JSON file or a Parquet file. And then we can go to completely unstructured data, for whatever that might mean for you. That could be video, that could be images. All these kind of files could be ingested into our lake where, where, where we can process it. And we can store all of that within our lake house structure. All right. So um, once we've sort of got a handle of what kind of data we'll be working with, we'll think about the you know, how we go about developing things. So data warehouses are pretty easy. We only have T-SQL. That is the language that we have today in SQL Server. Okay, a couple of things that might be missing. CLI, right? We're not going to be doing that. You're probably never going to find that in the product. Uh, it's barely used within SQL, at least in my experience. Um, so it is T-SQL only. On the Spark side, we've got a different story, right? So, so Spark actually supports a richer selection of languages. And all of this is actually made possible through a sort of an abstraction through an API, which is really great because what that means is we can use all four of those languages at the same time, right? We don't have to necessarily have different sessions for different languages. We can, we can chop and change between the two or between the four. Uh, so the languages are Scala. So Scala is a Java uh, sort of derivative and is the language that Spark was actually natively written in. So if you are looking to push the the edges of that performance. You know, Scala is something you want to look at. The PySpark is almost definitely the most common language used by data engineers and uh, data scientists nowadays. Okay, um, we've also got Spark SQL. So this is not a uh, a a, a one-for-one -one mapping between T SQL. There are a number of differences. So mainly syntax. Uh, syntax. So, a uh, simple example, there is no such thing as a top 10. We would say select star from table and then we'd say limit 10. So, it looks very, uh, looks a lot more like MySQL than it does like T-SQL, right? Okay, but these are all sort of syntactic things that shouldn't take a team long to adapt to. Uh, then there's how we actually, you know, what are these coding artifacts? Now, when, we, when we're working with SQL, we tend to work with SQL scripts, so we often open in something in Management Studio and create a new tab. Uh, we can create those scripts, whether we're using something at Management Studio, because, because it presents exactly like a SQL server. So if I want to use Management Studio, I absolutely can. If I want to use the web portal, I can do that too. Okay, so SQL scripts are probably your first point of choice. Or, and we can also encapsulate that code in store procedures. So store procedures are just uh, predefined bits of script that we store in the metadata of the database itself. And then we can just call that up when we want to. All right, uh, within, within the data lake, we use Spark notebooks. So Spark notebooks are how, similar to that scripting language. And this is where I mentioned the ability to switch between languages. Notebooks uh, consist out of sort of code blocks, okay, or cells. And we can change the language between these cells as we go along. So if you like, if you like using, uh, let's say, extracting data out of source system out of SQL, because it's what I know, or perhaps that, you know, that code's already there, I can take that SQL, and then I, can, then I can sort of wrap that up in something else, and then I can use Python to do the data manipulation on it. So I get this nice best of both kind of scenario. And then we've got Spark jobs, which is how we sort of uh, uh, want to wrap up some of that code and productionalize it, especially if we're doing things like uh, a Spark structured streaming, which is a way of bringing data in in, in a sort of near real time environments. Okay. Um, yeah, so the next thing we're going to look at is the artifacts themselves. So what do we generate? Because each one of these things has something slightly different. Uh, data warehouses are, are, are pretty easy because it looks exactly like SQL Server, right? So we have databases as the top level objects. We can create schemas. Some people use schemas, some people don't. Maybe everything goes into DBO. Maybe it doesn't, okay. So we have schemas and then we can create tables, we can create views, store procedures and functions over that. So very SQL-like. You'll notice, you know, again, there are things that are missing. 
Okay, so we wouldn't find sequences and things like that. Okay, uh, but yeah, so we've got a very uh, sort of uh, sort of high mapping from coming from SQL. Uh, on the on the lake side, we have uh, probably something looks a little bit different. So we have tables. So tables are the artifacts that we create. We load or we write tables down to disk, but when we want to read them back in, Spark uses this notion of a data frame. So a data frame is an in-memory representation of your table or part of your table, and we do our data manipulations uh, in this in-memory structure, and then we write it back down. So maybe a slight mental shift from the way we do things with SQL, where we sort of apply that update statement against the base tables themselves. Okay, but uh, you know it does it does lend itself to a very uh, um, repeatable sort of patterns that we can generate with this code. So if I want to make nice reusable code, you know, Spark lends itself very nicely to that. Um, we've also got files and folders. We can generate almost any artifact type that we want. So if we wanted to make a call out to one of these new uh, cognitive APIs or, uh, you know, these sort of uh, uh, generative AI, have images getting generated, theoretically we can do that, right? Okay, and then jobs we spoke about being that encapsulated thing in something like a wheel file or other, uh, other sort of ways of taking that code and uh, sort of publishing it. All right, uh, uh, and then finally the thing I'm gonna look at is security. So security is one of the areas where they differ quite heavily, okay? Um, so on the data warehouse side, we've got a rich set of security options, okay? So we have object, object level security. We can grant access to things like tables or views. Uh, we can do things like granting access to a view, but not the tables underneath it. Uh, we've got row level security or column level security, and perhaps even other security things like data masking. So I want the data visible, but only in this sort of masked fashion. I have all of these kind of options that I don't really have within Spark. So Spark, has none, okay. Now that's a bit of a deceptive sort of statement, but essentially if, if, if Spark has access to that storage account, it can see everything. There's no way of limiting columns, limiting rows. So Spark is a very all or nothing approach, which is why we probably wanna think about how we lay out our artifacts within our workspaces. Because workspaces are our ultimate security barrier around things. So we probably want to use workspaces to separate different work personas. We don't want our business analysts digging in our raw data. So, so uh, Spark has very little security, but it did come with that T-SQL endpoint. And that, and that SQL endpoint does have better security. So we can grant users access to that. And it comes with row, uh, you know, row level security and table level security. So we can deny access at those two levels, but nothing really below. Now, if you were in Cusper's session earlier, he did, he did hint that you should probably pay attention next week at FabricCon, I think it's called. Hopefully something new and exciting coming there. Okay. So, so those are the four sort of areas uh, I, I sort of chose to choose. Uh, the next logical question becomes, you know, well, which one should I choose? And there is no answer, uh, but the, the traditional consulting answer is always going to be, it depends, right? It's never, there's never going to be a, you know, what's right for me is not going to be right for you. And what's right for me today might not even be right for me next year. So, you know, so is the nature of working with technology. But here's a couple of questions that you might think about. Okay, so what types of data will you be using for? Am I sucking data out of a well-structured ERP system where everything comes in nice tabular structures? Or am I sucking in social media data? Am I sucking in video feeds? Am I sucking in APIs that are prone to changes, right? If I'm thinking, if I've got that moving data, Spark's probably a better choice. If I have those complex types, I'm dealing with a lot of geospatial data. Again, Spark is probably a better choice. All right. Uh, what is your team currently using? If you are a SQL heavy uh, 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 shop today, chances are you're gonna think about using a warehouse. There's, there's no reason not to leverage those skills. Okay, there is a, it's a, it's a minor uh, uh, sort of upskill to move from your on-prem uh, in, in, into the cloud, so that's probably what you're gonna want to do. Now, does the solution require complex transactions? We spoke about having uh, uh, the need for, especially in financial systems, health systems, where I need to have that sort of transactional security, especially in a direct lake world where you know, everything becomes visible immediately to my model, okay? Um, so if I need those, that kind of transaction, I'm only gonna get that from, uh, from, from, from the data warehouse, 
Okay, I'm not going to get something like that within Spark. Okay, uh, we spoke about uh, Delta supporting ACID. It's only table level ACID, right? So don't think about those transactions as being consistent across multiple tables. It only applies to the table itself. All right, and finally, uh, now do we want to support complex transformations? Uh, SQL's great for basic things. I want to R trim, L trim, upper, those kind of things. Maybe I want to pivot. Spark has an incredibly rich ecosystem of these kind of transformations, and we can wrap up these things into sort of external libraries we, we can import and reuse. So if we want to build up nice patterns that just says, hey, here's a sign of code, and this is how our company deals with type two dimensions, that is very easy to encapsulate in something like uh, a Spark, where a SQL, we, you know, is every stored procedure being written according to our standards, right? So, uh, yeah, so external libraries are a nice way of uh, facilitating a lot of uh, uh, a sort of com complex changes in, in our applications. So those are basically four of the questions I thought. Uh, but again, your answer is always going to be, is it depends. Uh, so that's it. I think we're on time. Um, just a heads up, so please, uh, the, our, our feedback form uh, to provide evaluations. Uh, important to note is that for every form that is submitted, SQL Bits will make a donation on your behalf to one of two charities. So this is like a cost-free way for you to give back. So please do that. Uh, and we are up time, so I will take questions over here if there are any. All right, thank you. Um.